Yeah. I, I, then the other side of engineering management is people management. I, I really believe firmly in right people, right seat. And I think that's a large portion of what I call like, like this 10 X environment is if you give somebody the types of problems that they love to solve, you can see their gears turn faster. You know, they're in, if you enjoy work, you are going to do way better at your work. Like all of those sort of things just kind of lock in. Hello, welcome to the Career Curious Podcast. I'm your host, George Roos. I'm joined today with Keegan Rice, Engineering Manager. Keegan, do you mind introducing yourself? My name's Keegan. I'm an engineering manager at Company Cam. I've been there for almost two years. Before that, I owned a software consultancy, and I, I've been in the industry for about 13 years. Nice. I think this is the first time we've had an engineering manager or a manager in general on the podcast. Like, how'd you get started in management? How'd you know that was going to be a thing that you wanted to do? Yeah. So I, early on in my career, I did not think I wanted to be in management. I even remembered saying like, nah, that's not for me. What, what made it apparent that, that I wanted to do that was I was a good engineer, but I realized where I gravitated to was just problems. It didn't matter if it was technical problems or process problems or people, whatever. I gravitated to the largest problem that had the most impact. I think that actually ended up shaping my direction into management was that I saw that I could spend my time helping to make environments that really helped other people. In the software world, they always talk about like, there's this t mythical 10X developer who can produce 10 times more than anybody else. What I've come to realize is that my goal as a manager is to make 10X environments where any person comes in and they can be the 10X version of themselves. The constraints they might've had elsewhere are removed. They're allowed to flourish in their own strengths, covered by their teammates, making an environment where people can really flourish. I saw that as the ultimate problem statement, if you will. I just noticed I was gravitating more and more towards why are we doing this in the process or what is going on here and everything of that sort. And then it was just like, man, you know what? That I like that stuff way more than tackling the next biggest, you know, coding problem or, you know, building a certain API or mobile app or whatever. So I guess what started your journey towards becoming an engineering manager? It was somewhat, I would say, forced. I had, had one of my best friends and we had always talked about we wanted to start a company together. And so, oh, I'm bad at timing. Maybe it was 2018. Okay. We decided to start a small software consultancy together. We were building startups and it was just the two of us at first. And we we're like, okay, we're growing. We need more people. So we hired people. And then because we hired people, we started managing people. I was still writing code. And then as we grew to 10 people, I was doing a lot of management of people in, in our process as a whole, I was managing the flow of work. And I noticed more and more that if I had the option between writing code or solving a, a people or process problem, I just gravitated towards that. So when I decided to leave my company and do something new, it was pretty clear to me. I was like, oh yeah, I want to be fully in the people management, but also it was really important to me to find a role where I, I could heavily influence the process as well. Absolutely. I want to ask you so many more questions because I relate to the engineering manager job, but I also want to stay like on topic and, but maybe we'll have a second interview where I can dive deep because I'm thinking questions like what percentage is people management versus uh, the, the, the engineering side? Uh, how do you manage the cognitive separation between those two in the interest of being on topic, what is your day to day? Like when you start your week, what does that feel like for, for users to hear? Yeah. So my role is like half people management and half process management. I know that engineering management roles across the engineering landscape can look very different. There's some roles where it's actually like half part-time you're writing code, part-time you're managing people. So there, there's a variety of different ones, but for me, it, it's process and people. So I manage three teams. Usually the, what my you know, start of week looks like is I am, I spend time figuring out for each of my teams, where are they at in the process and thinking about what's next? What is the very next thing? Not like long-term what's next, but like what's literally, okay, hey, we started on Monday. What do we need to accomplish this week? And then from there, it, it this is going to sound overly simple and I, and I like to keep things overly simple, but my major question that I ask my teams, I'm asking my people, I'm asking myself is, okay, what is our objective for this week? 
what are the things that are going to cause us to either be slow in reaching that objective or are going to stop us from reaching that objective? And what are the things that are going to either speed us up or make us reach that objective? So it's basically two questions with slightly different flavors of it. And that's, that's how I approach how I spend my time. That's how I approach, you know, where I spend uh, my energy, quite, you know, so our team, we have a weekly check-in with each of my teams. We don't do daily stand-ups or any of that sort of stuff. And I'm asking the same question. Don't give me a status report. What is it that you think you can accomplish by the end of this week? And what would stop or slow you down? I see a large portion of my job is to find those stoppages or blockages and go get rid of them. So it could be, hey, I don't have enough information to do the next thing. All right, cool. My job now is to figure out who's the person who can give you that information, bring that to the team. Maybe it's me, maybe it's someone else. I need to get context to the team. Or it might be, well, we do X, we need to have Y done first. Is that something our team can accomplish? No. Okay, now I need to figure out what team needs to accomplish that or who needs to accomplish that. What conversations do I need to have? So I, a large portion of my role being the team workhorse, let the team stay focused on what they're trying to accomplish. And I go figure out all the other crap, you know, like yeah, whatever like else, are, like a liaison. I want my team to stay in context as much as possible and stay focused. So anything that's like a rabbit trail or something that slows them down, it's like, okay, cool. I need to go fix it. A good chunk of my time is that. And then the second thing is what are my teams doing that other people need to know? So for instance, I, I manage our R and D team. And so we kind of see ourselves as an enablement team. So we enable the capabilities of certain things, but product teams need to be able to go and actually make features or improvement based off of that. So I need to be informing the right people at the right time before something is enabled, letting them know two months in advance, one month in advance, whatever it is, Hey, this is coming. Here's what this unlocks for you. Here's different avenues we see you could potentially go down. What is my team doing today that someone needs to know about in the proverbial tomorrow? Not necessarily actually tomorrow, but like, okay, cool. I need to inform someone, Hey, this is coming. Or it could be the other direction too. It's like, what is my team doing today? That's going to cause problems for someone else tomorrow. Like, Hey, by the way, we're going to be doing this big change. It's going to slow down this thing over here or might cause some rework over here. So that's another part of that communication. You know, liaison is a great word. Like I'm a li liaison from my team to other people. Absolutely. I thank you for all of that. Like, it's sparking so much in me that I'm taking notes and I don't usually take notes during interviews. Can you tell me an accomplishment recently that you're proud of? Yeah. I, I then the other side of engineering management is people management. I, I really believe firmly in right people, right seat. I think that's a large portion of what I call it like this 10x environment is if you give somebody the types of problems that they love to solve you can see their gears turn faster you know they're in if you enjoy work you are going to do way better at your work like all of those sort of things just kind of lock in so we had a guy on one of my teams who was doing great work but i saw that where he gravitated to wasn't the type of work that our team was doing he was happy but i i think there might actually be a spot where you go from happy and, and good to excellent and really excited about work. So we had this conversation about this opening on another team. And I was like, Hey, I like you, you might think I'm trying to push you, but I really do think this might be the right direction for you. He was a little bit nervous at first. Then he decided, yeah, that does sound good. He ended up moving to the other team. I was talking to him recently. He's loving it. I'm seeing the impact of his work. He's just crushing everywhere. And I see that like a huge accomplishment. Cause it's like being able to see somebody who wasn't doing poorly. This wasn't a poor performer who suddenly became a you know, top. He was a good performer who just became excellent. So he moved from top to topper. Right? Absolutely. And I think that's an important thing. A lot of times we wait till there's a problem with someone to do something. And I think it's important for us to be able to recognize, Hey, maybe this person's doing good here, but there's a better spot that they could be at where they could really excel. Yeah. I love that so much. I've experienced that in my career as well. I almost got goosebumps hearing you tell that story because a lot of times you hear that question, you, know, you get a technical answer, right? But as engineering managers, we tend to have to be on both sides of those things. Hearing the story and watching someone's growth is really, really cool, especially watching someone flow that is going to impact everything they do after that, right? Absolutely. I, I love that. Next question. Uh, you're an engineering manager now and you started as a individual contributor, yet you had a business and all these different roles. 
what's the graduation of this role? Like maybe not specific to you, but for a listener that knows what comes after engineer manager, what's next? Typically at a, a typical company, the progression would be engineering manager, then more of a director role, or it, it all depends on the size of the company. If you have director roles, VP of engineering, that would be your typical chain engineering manager, director of engineering, VP of engineering, and then potentially a CTO. That would be your career path. I do think it's important to know where you fit best. When I owned my own company and we were building startups, I saw myself as eventually being a CEO. I thought that's going to be the path for me. I want to start a company. I want to start a startup, you know, all of this. And I tested that out a little bit. There was a product that I wanted to build and all of this sort of stuff. And what I came to realize is that that was not the path for me. I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm an intrapreneur. The, the difference between those two things is important. I think it's, it's really good for every person to wrestle with. Just because something has been designed as the path, should you follow it all the way or should you follow it at all. For me, I was a small business owner. The next step is to either grow your business or get a C-level title somewhere else. What I realized through trial and error was that I worked best under someone else guiding the business, doing the sales stuff and helping the business grow. I worked best as a sidekick to that type of thing where it's like, hey, I will help the business run. I will help all of the little pieces that need to fit together, the communication that needs to happen. Like that's where I thrive. And so say that because I think it's important even for me, but it's like for a lot of people, it's like, hey, you know what? Contentment can be a hard thing, but it might end up being that the best place for you is to be just a senior engineering manager. The corporate world tells you, you need to grow, change the ladder and everything of that sort. Find something that you're good at, that you love doing, where you're able to make an impact. And if, if, and it, if it pays well, all of those things line up, you love what you do, you have an impact and it pays well, you don't need to chase the ladder, but that ladder is there. You don't need to keep going up it. Absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. I love that. It'd be hard for me not to go into details. I can't wait to interview you again. Hopefully you'll let me interview you again. Of um, so what's one more good question? So what are some of your challenges? What keeps you up at night or what do you forecast as things that you need to conquer? I, I, I think this goes across pretty much all industries and in all jobs, but I think it's really important in the software industry, communication. There is so much that can go wrong with communication. You can say one thing, people hear another. I think about that often with my teams or my role. Am I managing high performers, right? Am I giving them good feedback? Am I challenging them enough? Am I giving them more than just generic feedback? Do they feel excited about the work? And then teammates or people who I'm not managing, like, are we moving in the right direction? I've often said, especially in the software world, it doesn't matter how fast you go if you're running in the wrong direction. You can have a team that can just spit out code, build products, but if we're building the wrong thing, then it doesn't matter. I think that's what keeps me up to a certain extent is, am I helping the team be pointed in the right direction? Are we asking the right questions? Is there good communication where people feel involved and can push back? It's all underneath the umbrella of communication, but is there something that we missed or that I missed or that I didn't communicate well that's going to cause us problems in the future? I love that answer so much. And you probably already know this about me too. If I could write a book right now, it would be called, Are We Asking the Right Questions? Mm. Because I feel like so many times people are moving the wrong directions. Um, and I, I was trying not to go too deep into my own story, <laughs> but I love like the idea of people, like there's a problem. Are we putting a bandaid on a gunshot wound? A bandaid is useful, but for the problem, I don't think it's going to solve it. Yeah. So definitely agree with that. So I guess last, maybe two questions. If everything were set clear, you weren't in this role and we're just in a vacuum. What careers are you curious about? What would you like to learn about uh, someone else? Oh, that's a good question. I would be curious to know like leadership consulting or how do you help high performers become good leaders? I think that there can be a difference between those two things, but how do companies, leadership teams, or even beyond just companies, but like how do leaders grow themselves, learn how to lead more effectively, any of that sort of stuff? Like, what does that look like? Who's doing it? Is it a self taught or self-managed, that would be of interest to me. Absolutely. And so I always ask that question because 
that gives me uh, energy to go find someone who can answer that question. So hopefully in an upcoming episode, we'll find a, a leadership consultant. Do you have any questions for me? What is one thing that you've learned? I know you've done a few of these now. Um, what is something that you've learned recently that you were kind of shocked by? Absolutely. I love that question. I am shocked because I've known you for a year or two years, somewhere in that range. I've known some friends that have been on the podcast and I've known them for a long time. And I'm amazed at how much information doesn't get said about people's perspectives in normal conversation. I'm learning so many different things about people and their day to day. Like, what does your day to day look like? What motivates you? How'd you get into this space? What will you do next? What are you curious about? These are questions that in our normal way of going about life don't emerge, right? Because we're very transactional. We're very, mm. how do I get this A to B, that, that success, repeat, do it again. And we don't ask the questions like, Keegan, what was it like running your own company? When did you know that a transition was going to happen into this new work? That's a question I've never asked you, but this platform gives me the opportunity to dig deeper, trying to ask a question I think someone else would be curious about. And therefore, it's like opening up more transparent conversations. So then I feel like I get to learn more about people, but then it sparks my curiosity. So your curiosity ends up sparking my curiosity. The reason I started the podcast was to allow people a platform to share what they do. But now I'm finding myself energized. Yeah, so it's, I didn't anticipate that happening. And I mean, really enjoying it. Like it's, it feels like a genuine connection. That is true, especially in the workforce. You don't end up actually getting to know the backstories of people, especially in the remote workforce where you don't have that kind of water cooler, coffee break sort Absolutely. of thing. Thank you, Keegan, very much for your time. Uh, I look forward to part two. I'll tell you what I'm thinking about part two. I, I can see two or three versions of part two. Maybe there'll be a three or four if you have the patience for it. But diving deeper into engineering management, uh, what is it like being a people manager? What are some of the difficult parts of that job? I would love to bring in two or three engineering managers from different companies so that you can see like, how do they compare and contrast? What's the differences between engineering managers here versus there? Another one I could see a, play, yeah. a playlist for, how does AI affect your role like on your team specifically, mm -hmm. or what you're doing, forecasting the future sort of stuff. Yeah, just a ton of things because obviously this is my space too. But hearing you talk, it sparks so many uh, curiosities. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you being on the podcast. I look forward to the next time. Yeah, I, man. Thank you so much for having me. This has been super fun.